Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Cube, and in this video I'm going to take an in-depth look at the Tier 8 Premium French ground attack aircraft, the NC-1070. Hello there, and here we are on the tarmac outside my hangar, looking at the Tier 8 Premium French ground attack aircraft, the NC-1070. And if it's French, you may be wondering why it has Soviet emblems on it. Well, I'll explain that in a moment. And this is quite an unusual looking aircraft. Uh, twin booms, twin tails, and this isn't a pod at the back. The fuselage goes all the way to the back and has a, a rear gunner. More on that in a bit. And one of these was actually built, uh, not in a ground attack role, at least that wasn't the intention, more as a dive bomber or anti-submarine aircraft. Um, it flew in 1947. Uh, unfortunately, it crashed in 1948. It never flew again after that. It was abandoned in favour of the model that replaced the uh, propeller uh, piston engines with jet engines. Rolls-Royce Neans, in fact. So, quite an interesting aircraft to look at. Now, we better explain why this um, French aircraft has the Soviet emblems on it. So, I'm just going to bring up the UI. And if you don't know how to do that, the toggle is Control-H. There we go. This is one of the aircraft that occupies uh, a slot in the tech tree which is under Europe. It's actually Europe International in my opinion because there's an Israeli aircraft here. And there are a number of aircraft here of which the NC-1070 is one. And these premium aircraft, they're all premiums of course, have a very interesting feature, a very useful feature. So if we go back to the aircraft and I'll show you what that feature is right now. The reason this aircraft has Soviet symbols is because I've right-clicked here and I've changed its nation away from France to the Soviet Union. And I could change it to the UK, Japan, uh, United States or Germany as well, or indeed back to France. If I want to change it to one of these major nations though, it will cost me 100,000 credits. However, the potential to train crews across five of, major, of the major nations makes all of these premium aircraft extremely useful. So bear that in mind if you're thinking about uh, obtaining this aircraft. OK, so now you know why we have Soviet emblems on there. What we're going to do next is take a look at the numbers of all the tier 8 ground attackers. If you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, use the link below to skip ahead to another part of the video. Here's the spreadsheet showing all of the Tier 8 Grand Attackers. There are four of them, as you can see. I'm going to take a moment to explain how this spreadsheet works. If you know that already, then use the link below to skip ahead to the discussion of the numbers themselves. So, the NC-1070 occupies column C and D here, and each of the other three Grand Attackers have two columns of their own, as you can see off to the right. Down the left, we can see the information that you would see in the hangar UI. I've supplemented that with some information concerning the weapons, although in this particular case, for Grand Attackers, it's not necessarily that relevant. Auto aim angle, dispersion angle, and overheat time. The body of the information, the numbers, the important stuff, is all here, the part that I'm circling. And let's just take a look at uh, the color coding, etc. For this purposes of this comparison, the configuration was stock. Ordnance, of course, mounted. Wouldn't be much of a ground attacker if you didn't have ordnance. Equipment was taken off and the pilot sent back to the barracks. The modules are all top. Green means that the aircraft is best in class uh, for that particular rating. Light blue, second best in class. Light purple, third best in class. And a gold color behind the aircraft name indicates that it's a premium or a reward aircraft, as indeed the NC-1070 obviously is. And I reverse the logic for good measure using red colors for worst in class figures. Okay, that's how the spreadsheet works. Let's start to, dis to discuss the numbers themselves. Let's start with the guns. And we've got a pair of two uh, 30mm cannons uh, cowling mounted on the NC-1070. Um, their rating is 44, which is third best in class, and considering there's only four aircraft in the comparison, third best of class is already uh, disappointing. And there's a reason why the IL-10M's uh, weaponry is probably a, a bit worse, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, cumulative DPS of 680. Uh, the range, 2,300 feet. What you'll find is as you're approaching targets, especially if you're approaching a, a low altitude AA gun emplacement, you'll start being shot by it before you can shoot uh, back. 
Uh, it's the same with the ME329, to be fair. Um, not so the IL-20, which has got a massively uh, a, a greater range with these pair of two fifty uh, pair of fifty seven millimeter cannons, the IL ten M is a bit of a special here, but has some uh, slightly range, longer range weaponry as well. Auto aim angle, dispersion angle, probably not that relevant here, except to mention that pretty much all of these ground attackers have no assistance when you're firing at, at enemy aircraft, and particularly if you're firing at uh, small objects, you're going to find it quite hard to hit because the game almost is pretty much insisting that you're dead on target before you can hit. In fact, there is no auto aim assistance on the IL-20 at all, whereas you get at least get one degree on the other three aircraft. Dispersion angle, 0.6 on the NC-1070. Not really relevant when you're shooting at ground targets. You can hardly miss unless you're not paying attention. Um, and when it comes to shooting aircraft, the auto aim angle is more important than the dispersion angle. Um, overheat time is important, though, and it's worst in class, I'm afraid. It's eight seconds. Um, the others have either 10 or 9 seconds and you've got a twin problem here with these cannons they're not very punchy they're in fact there's a three problems I didn't expect a Spanish Inquisition these cannons are not very punchy they have relatively short range and they overheat fairly quickly uh, and that's a bit disappointing in a ground attacker it's better news with the turret though um, this is the best turret out of all four of these aircraft because it has 208 cumulative damage and it fires at very nearly 3,000 uh, accurately at very nearly 3,000 feet. Well, the range is uh, the same on the ME329 and the IL-20. It's rather less on the IL-10M. Um, but be warned, if you're in a light fighter at extreme range behind one of these, particularly behind the NC-1070 because it has, does 208 cumulative damage, you're going to lose your aircraft probably before you've got a chance of shooting down, well, certainly a full health one of these uh, aircraft. You have been warned. Let's take a look at the ordnance, and there's not really a compensation for what are fairly anemic guns. You have eight 100 kilogram, kilogram bombs, and the rating is um, 21, which is worst in class, along with the IL-10M, which isn't solely a ground attacker anyway. Uh, they do 22,400 cumulative damage and the resupply time is a shocking 120 seconds. This is going to really hamper you. Uh, and what it means is that the NC-1070, what with its fairly weak guns and fairly weak ordnance, it's a traditional premium. It's pretty much worse than the Tech Tree aircraft. And personally, I like it that way. Those days have long gone, um, but there you go. As you can see, the ordnance on the ME329 is poor, but there are compensating factors insofar as the guns are a bit better, and also we'll see that this aircraft is quite a bit faster. The ordnance on the IL-20 is impressive for a ground attacker. A couple of bombs, which are 500 kilogram bombs and 12 rockets, 28,000 um, 400 cumulative damage, really impressive. The drawback of this aircraft is it's slow. And then the IL-10M pretty much has rockets and bombs, which are, are the equivalent of the bombs of the NC-170. But this aircraft has a special role, which I'll come on to um, as I discuss the next sections. Survivability. Well, it's third worst in class. Um, 1,300 hit points is a good slug. It's more than the German, um, but it's less than the... Uh, uh, the IL-20. Uh, it's considerably more than the IL-10M. Um, you are going to be able to take a bit of a beating, particularly from light fighters. You'll probably be able to get those off your tail, especially as you've got that pokey rear gun. Mm, heavy fighters are going to give you a bit of a problem, but then if you play carefully, you can often force heavy fighters to break off their attack and then you can pelt them with a the gun whilst they're trying to turn and get a, another pass on you. So bear that in mind. Airspeed. Well, for the purposes of this comparison, it's uh, third best in class. Airspeed is a problem when it comes to manoeuvring, uh, traveling from sector to sector. It's not really a, a, an issue over the, the sector. You want to probably slow down when you're delivering your bombs with this aircraft anyway. Uh, it so happens that the most mobile is the ME329, and that makes it a bit more useful is certainly when you need to capture sectors and bear in mind one of the uh, uh, class specific missions for ground attackers as you'll see is actually capturing sectors so this is a bit of a sluggard unfortunately not as slow as the soviet aircraft 
that really will take you some time to travel between sectors, uh, but still slow enough to be a little bit tedious. Maneuverability, well, maneuverability in a grand attacker, with one exception, is not really the name of the game. It happens to be the, the uh, third worst in class here. Uh, sorry, the second, yes, the third worst in class. I've got that right the first time. It's not as maneuverable just as the ME329. It's a lot more maneuverable than the IL-20. Look at this I figure though. And this may give you a clue as to what the IL-10M really specializes in, in in a moment. I'll, I'll talk to you about it. The point being, if you are up against an ME329, you really want to either know how to turn your aircraft and try and minimize this um, um, slight advantage that the ME329 has, better still come up on it behind and shoot it down. The same with the IL-20, which you can outmaneuver with some ease. The IL-10M, okay, it's going to take a little while to shoot you down because it's got pretty poor guns, but you want to catch this from behind uh, and prioritize its destruction if you find one of these over a sector. And it's now time for me to say that the IL-10M is a bit of a horrible aircraft when it comes to ground attacking because it's really a ground attacker hunter. And that's why it's fairly weak on ground attack uh, capability. Its role is really to get in there and destroy the enemy ground attackers and then use a little bit of ordnance on the ground targets that are remaining, perhaps to flip the sector. Altitude performance pretty irrelevant here. All of the ground attackers have pretty minimal ground um, uh, altitude performance. I do force the uh, NC-1070 up to about 3,000 feet quite frequently. Um, one of the things you will be able to do uh, if your team is dominating the battlefield and has all of the sectors, you can actually fly at that kind of heat, uh, sorry, that kind of um, altitude, and you can try and bait aircraft into following you, and then you can pelt them with your rear gun. Or you can hit them with the forward guns as well. They won't like that very much either. Okay, let's just drop down. Well, here we've got it confirmed. Worst in class uh, DPS, um, which is a bit, a bit of a shame. And then lots of red appearing elsewhere as well. I don't think there's really much point in going in here. I just want to draw your attention to the um, figure here again, the overheat time. That's going to hamper you. You're going to have to think about that. Now, Grand Attackers used to be very powerful aircraft in the game, but I'm afraid they've been superseded by the introduction of bombers, which came along quite a bit later. So there's something I want to show you. So what I've done here is I've added um, four more columns, two each for two aircraft, uh, the B-29C Superfortress, a bomber, and the RB-17, also a bomber. I've picked off the two premium ones because they're the main problem, um, but there are, of course, a pair of tech tree bombers. I haven't put in all of the information here because it's not relevant, but I do just want to draw your figure, uh, attention to the ordnance figures here. The B-29C drops two sticks of 20 bombs, and it does 172,000 ground damage, which dwarfs all of the ground attackers here. And the resupply time is 80 seconds, which is less than the NC-1070 in particular. This aircraft, the B-29C, well, you may think of it as a bit of a lumbering beast, and it is a little bit slower in cruise flight, but it has a long boost than the NC-1070. 1070, but it boosts faster than the NC-1070. I haven't got those figures on here. Take my word for it. And then on the other scale, three sticks of six bombs each. Um, I thought they were fours, actually, but there you go. Apparently it's um, three, six. Nevertheless, the key point here is that the RB-17, which is quick, does 40,000 more or less cumulative damage. Again, more than any of these grand attackers and the reload time is 40 seconds. And of course, that's the base reload time. People have got that down into the low 30s if they specialize this aircraft. And um, what it means is that um, when you're flying tier eight uh, ground attackers, if you find either of these two aircraft or potentially even the other bombers, uh, the Soviet and the German tech tree bombers in the game, you may struggle to actually uh, find targets to destroy that they haven't already destroyed, whether they're on your own team or whether they're on the enemy team. So just bear that in mind, ground attacking in this game can now be a little bit of a frustrating experience. Okay, so let's just try and sum up the NC-1070. It's a traditional style premium aircraft. It's weaker, in my opinion, than the uh, Tech-T equivalents at Tier 8. The guns suffer from three problems, which I've outlined a little bit earlier. Um, 
relatively um, weak in terms of being able to destroy targets. How many times will you end up shooting at a bunker and failing to destroy it? Count them. There'll be quite a lot of times. Fairly short range and the overheat is quite quick. Really good rear gun. Use that to your advantage. But then the ordnance is also a bit weak as well. And that means that this aircraft, especially when it's um, fighting against bombers, which carry a lot more ordnance and are just about as quick, if not quicker than it, can struggle to make an impact. And you shouldn't be surprised if um, that's the case. However, as I mentioned earlier, you can assign this aircraft to any of the major nations and make it a pretty useful crew trainer, not just for ground attack crews for the German and Soviet lines, but you might consider training your bomber crews or indeed your heavy crews if they have a rear gunner on this aircraft. OK, I think that's enough about the numbers. Let's go and have a look and see how I've set this aircraft up. Here we are back on the tarmac outside my hangar looking at the NC-1070 and the first thing to say is that my example of this aircraft is specialised which means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available to me but let's have a quick look and see what you'd be missing when you first acquired this aircraft and as you can see both for equipment and consumables you'd be missing the turret slot. Let's pop the aircraft back into specialist configuration and we'll discuss what I've actually done. Quite a lot to take in here. OK, so in the cockpit slot we have the ultimate cockpit armour, well cockpit armour which I've taken to the ultimate level. Um, that confers extra resistance to injuries of both the members of the crew, that's important. Probably wouldn't have these bonus characteristics um, if I were to reassemble the equipment. If we just press the ALT key we can see other ones and you can't move it of course. Uh, what would I pick off here? Um, roll manoeuvrability at the bottom is not worth having, nor is the aircraft HP, but the 10% tolerance to damage from fire is uh, better than the 2% aircraft HP. Uh, so I'd probably uh, take the aircraft HP bonus off and put on that tolerance. Okay. Uh, in the airframe, we've got a reinforced airframe, which increases the aircraft HP by 13%. That's worth having. And if we look at the bonus characteristics again, 10% resistance to fire, well that's good, this aircraft will go on fire more than you might expect even with a fairly healthy fire resistance. Uh, tails resistance to critical damage, you might think that's a bit of an odd choice in an aircraft that doesn't depend on manoeuvrability, but when you're low to the ground, if you lose your tail, you'll probably find yourself more often than not flying into the ground. So it's worth having that uh, resistance as well to try and reduce that possibility. Roll manoeuvrability I've got selected here, that's the wrong choice. I think I would take the 10% tolerance to damage from AA guns, which is the third choice there. Interesting um, uh, forward firing weapon choices and I've settled on gas operated action after quite a long time using a different piece of equipment. I've decided that rate of fire is more important for, for me and these bonus characteristics are the ones that I want. 10% um, chance of causing a fire which might help when you're shooting at a bunker that refuses to blow up. If you set it on fire it may blow up um, as you fly by it which is useful. But then the more important ones are the 10% and 5% cooldown rate. So the theory I've got here is that although the guns overheat uh, a little bit quicker, um, they'll come back um, more quickly as well and allow me to do more damage. Now, you could argue um, that uh, other choices are better. I tried the long gun barrels for an increased range of fire, and I do find that the short range, relatively short range of this, these weapons, 2300 feet, is a bit of a problem. So increasing the range seems like a good idea, but in the end I decided that the extra bit of range that you were getting from the long gun barrels wasn't really helping. You could try you increasing the burst length, since the burst length is only 8 seconds, that's a good argument. I haven't actually tried the bolt carriers because I ended up being happy with the gas operated action. But do think hard about it, this is an important choice and you need to get the one that suits you best. I have an improved turret gun sight. Um, I haven't taken this up to either advanced or um, ultimate level, but already I'm getting 12% extra firing range. Um, if we look at the bonus characteristics, and I must stop moving the mouse when I do this, 5% uh, chance of inflicting critical damage with a defensive turret for the moment, and if I just scan down there very quickly, I think I would pick the 10% um, chance of inflict inflicting critical damage, which is the fourth one down there, and then the fifth one down, gunner's resistance to in um, injuries. Nope, I'd pick the sixth one. Firing range, increase it by another 5%. Why not? And 
I think there's only one choice of equipment for the outboard weapon. I've already mentioned the uh, horrible 120 second reload at base for the bombs. Uh, and they're not great bombs in the first place, so I've gone for strength and hard point points to bring down the bomb reload speed as much as possible. And I've selected the bonus characteristics. And uh, the important one there is uh, another 10% quicker bomb reload speed. And then I've made the aircraft just a little bit faster. Probably won't notice it, but any anything helps to try and get it between sectors a bit quicker. So what effect did that have on the bomb reload speed? Well, it came down from 120 seconds to about 84, 85. And that's still too long, frankly. Uh, and it does affect what you decide to do when you're traveling about from sector to sector. And you'll see that in the forthcoming battle as a, an instance where I choose to go to a sector that you might be surprised by. As far as consumables are concerned, two person crew, either one of them being injured is a nuisance. So it's a first aid kit. The resistance to fire is fairly good. So I don't need a fire extinguisher. Engine cooling, this is for 10 seconds of extra boost, which you will generally use traveling between sectors uh, and it will help uh, you a little bit just to get to another sector a little bit faster. As I say, this aircraft does feel a bit sluggish to me. Uh, universal ammunition on both the forward firing weapons and the turret. I don't use gold, as you know. And then I've put improve fragmentation on to try and improve the uh, damage output of the bombs, which is important because these aren't great bombs. Okay, now this aircraft, as I said at the beginning of the video, can be assigned to any of the major nations to train crews, and not just necessarily for ground attackers. Certainly you could train bomber crews in this, and at a pinch, some heavy crews as well. Um, so I would probably never configure a pilot's and um, rear gunner specifically for this plane, but what would I do? Um, well, I will say just by the by, you are going to want a good crew in this aircraft to improve its potential as much as possible. If you start with a stock crew, you're going to feel, feel the pain. And I've got two 10 skill point uh, crew members here, and this is from my IL-40P. And I actually originally was training a British heavy crew um, with this aircraft, therefore I decided to the UK, and I found it just wasn't working. Um, when I was trying to gather material for the video, I realised I had to swap to a, a crew which was more appropriate for ground attacking, and here it is. But if I was building a, um, a pilot for this plane, what would I do? Well, definitely first, demolition expert to increase the damage of what are fairly weak bombs. Protection expert to try and inc increase the aircraft's du durability so it can take more punishment whilst you're trying to do ground attacking. And then definitely engine guru one and engine guru two. There's not much point in going for accuracy. Where would I go next? Well, once I had the points, I'd probably go for battle tested. And then once I've got a third point, I'd probably put on resilience. Um, and then try and go back for something like battle tested as well. But that's a long way off. Um, once you become as, uh, beyond eight points, you're starting to face fairly long grinds for your skills. The gunner. Well, this air has been set up for the IL-40P. If I was setting it up for the NC-1070, there's nothing wrong with this setup. But I'd probably go defensive fire first and then try and get precision gunner next. Um, quick reflexes for increased aiming time is good. Now. The armor skill, I really don't know what this skill's about because you never run out of burst on turrets, so why increase the burst length by 50%? However, it does lead to this ballistics expert, which increases the range of fire, and that's a good thing. And whilst we're talking about range of fire, you might remember I said it was 2,953 uh, feet on the rear gun. What have I managed to get it up to? Let's have a look at the gun armament. Optimal distance is now very healthy, 3,602 feet, and it will go higher. And that means basically you can start shooting aircraft that are behind you long before they can shoot you, and that's really useful and can be quite fun as well, especially if you go gunshipping because you've got no, no, sec uh, no sectors that you can take if your team's dominating a battle and has got su air superiority. Okay, so that's how I've set the aircraft up. That's a discussion of pilot skills. I think it's time to go and see how this aircraft performs in battle. The map for the forthcoming battle is Alpine Gambit. It's uh, the snow and ashes variant, and the, it's a five sector map with the sectors laid out in a squashed five spots of the die configuration. And what we have here is a central military base flanked by two mining plants, and then on the other axis, flanked by two forward airstrips. Now, this is a map with lots of juicy targets for bombers and ground attackers. So that's a good thing straight away. 
The military base is the most important sector strategically and tactically. Strategically because it will help your team flip other sectors by firing rockets at them. And the mining plants are then just a little way behind um, insofar as uh, they give you not only your standard three resources every five seconds, but also an extra 80 in, uh, resources or influence points, if you want to call them that, um, every two minutes. And then the forward airstrips are very much the make weights in this particular com uh, map configuration. Um, tactically, though, as a grand attacker, I'm better suited for attacking mining plants, which many aircraft aren't, um, than necessarily going to the military base first, where lots of aircraft can have an impact and take the military base. So as a grand attacker, I probably won't go to what is the most important sector, but I will go to definitely the second most important sector first. And let's look at the order of battle. And we have a Vampire F1, which is a little bit low altitude, but should do well in the center. There I am in my NC-1070. And as I've already said, I'm going to go to the mining plant first because things like the Vampire can't really take a mining plant. And then down at the bottom, we have a VB-10 and a bomber, a Junkers 288A, also tier seven. The enemy's got a P-80A, which has got the highest DPS of any fighter at tier eight nowadays, now that the 50 cows have been um, buffed. However, it's not as maneuverable as the Vampire. That said, they also have a vampire, so it could be quite a hard contest in the center if those fighters start uh, scrapping over there. They also have a Spitfire, um, and then they have a B-32 bomber. So it's an interesting mix. The B-32 bomber is a bit of a lumber, but should be able to flip mining plants, and they've got three turn fighters, or three two turn fighters, or perhaps even one turn fighter in the form of the Spitfire, an aircraft that can actually do a bit of both of the um, traditional roles of the fighter, that, that's the high energy fighting or the turn fighting in the Vampire. And they've got the P-80A, which is a high energy fighter, but a really potent one these days. Um, I'm not sure who's got the advantage here, so we'll have to go and see how this battle turned out. Just before we enter battle, I'm going to take a moment to talk about why the reticle appears to be off target when I'm hitting uh, enemy aircraft with my guns. Um, I have mentioned this in previous videos, but it were, it's worth explaining again because I'm still getting questions about it. People asking me if I'm using a mod, whether they've missed a setting, or indeed just straight out asking me if I'm cheating. The World of Warplanes team have apparently uh, got a system whereby the replays are smoothed so that they don't appear jerky. And I'll speak about that in a moment. But unfortunately, one of the byproducts of this system is that it throws the reticle off target so that when you are aiming at aircraft and hitting them, it looks as if you're not aiming at them. This is not a mod. This is not a setting. And it's definitely not cheating. I have experimented with um, uh, directly recording the game. And that's got some technical difficulties. For instance, how do you manage to just get the audio from the game and not from other sources or from your computer when you're recording it? That's a, a, a matter I'll discuss elsewhere. And although the reticle is correctly placed, which is good, the videos are very, very jerky and quite unpleasant to watch. And I've decided to stay with the World of Warplanes team's videos and just put up with the fact that the reticle's off target. And now that I've explained that, I hope that you will as well. Okay, so let's get into the battle. And I've already said that with this aircraft, although the most important sector on the map, tactically and strat uh, strategically, is the military base, uh, the military base, of course, provides easy access to all the other um, sectors, as well as firing rockets at uh, sectors to try and flip them to your team, if you let them. Um, I'm the only aircraft on my team that's suited for attacking the mining plant, so that's more important to my team than going to the military base, I believe. So off we go. And without uh, hesitation, I'm heading straight for the special object in the middle of the power plant. And I'm going to place two bombs in the gap that's coming up between the cooling towers and the fuel storage units. One, two. One on top of the building, and one on top of the other building. And you'll have seen that I was shooting at the chimneys, got them all down, as well as shooting at that building um, at the back of the special object when I went in for my attack. Now, I've got two bombs left. I could reload, but it's an 84 second reload. And that means I'd reach the military base if I went there way before I had bombs again. So what I've decided to do instead, seeing that the military base is still contested, 
is go to the, this airfield where there are lots of soft targets that I can shoot with my guns and perhaps use these two extra bombs and then reload. And that's an example of this long reload causing you to fight differently in this aircraft from the way that you might fight in other ground attackers with shorter reload for the ordnance. So there's the first soft target down. The rear gunner is firing away. And that's another target down. Now I didn't get to use my bombs so I ought to reload here. And it looks as if I decided that the reload would still be too long and that we were getting to the point on the military base where, in fact, a couple of bombs would actually be useful. And then I've obviously changed my mind because I've just pressed the V key, which is my reload key, and I'm now reloading. So there's a couple of things I can do here. I can shoot soft targets, tents, and there are some of those at the military base. I can try and take out the enemy ground attackers, or possibly even this low-level low fighter that's uh, uh, in the sector. The first thing that I can shoot are these tents, so let's get rid of those first. The ground attacker comes towards me, and then I realise that the P-80A is coming straight for me. Well, that's a mistake. Just about the only two attack angles that it, uh, I have the um, advantage are if it's directly behind me, and I have a big advantage then because this has got a pokey gun, as I've said, um, or if it comes straight on head on at me, and that's exactly what it did. I still don't have bombs, but I was able to destroy the ground attack by getting behind it, a Russian one, and that was enough to flip the military base. Let's just have a quick look and see how we're doing. 28 sections of ground targets destroyed, and what I tend to do is I tend to take out special objects and then tented targets. Rear gunner is going away. It's a shame that you can't use the rear view in replays, but uh, you just have to put up with that. Now I've nearly got my bombs at last after 84 seconds. So we're off to the enemy military base. 160 capture points received and three sectors captured. And you need to keep an eye on uh, your sector captures, otherwise you'll find it hard to get high chevron battles. It's quite easy to fail to destroy targets and sectors, so make sure you get at least one in every sector that you visit. Put a few shots into the gunny placement. Spot that I can finish off a secondary target here with my guns, and I do so. I'm going to drop four bombs here because the special object's already gone. Good luck, I'll destroy that, and I have. Drop a couple here on the gun emplacement. And I'll reserve two bombs for another secondary object, and here is one. I'm going to try and take out that where hangar. Didn't manage to, but I dropped the bombs in the right place. And now I'm down to guns. I'm looking for targets that just need finishing off. So there's a bunker, and having destroyed that, I've managed to get them with the blind. So we're in a pretty good situation at the moment. We've got a 383 to 278 point lead. We've got both plants. Uh, we're still hanging on to the military base, although that looks as if it will fall. And in fact, it just has. However, I'm on a reload, so there's no point, as far as I'm concerned, in going to the military base. So I'm going to see if I can uh, seize this uh, uh, forward airstrip. Now, as it turns out, there isn't a lot of uh, uh, ground targets for me to shoot here. So I'm keeping an eye out for chances to shoot down aircraft as well. And here I stopped going for the ground target briefly. I looked backwards and used the turret to see if I could shoot down aircraft. And in fact I've just destroyed one with the rear gun and that has flipped this sector. I've still got plenty of health. This isn't a repair base anyway. Notice a fighter coming more or less straight towards me. I can't point the nose up anymore uh, because I haven't got my engine. I'll just stall. My teammates deal with the Spitfire that was incoming and I'm back off to the military base. 56 sections of ground targets destroyed. This is pretty healthy at this stage of the battle for this aircraft. Four chevrons already, that's quite good as well. 370 capture points and five sectors captured. I've already completed that class specific mission. And because of the fairly weak guns and because of the fairly weak ordnance, you will find that the first of these uh, specific missions is quite hard to complete in almost all of your battles. 
and I've been fortunate here. I'm matched up against the Tier 7 bomber, the B-32. And he hasn't been that quick to capture sectors. So I've been able to do quite a lot of other sectors whilst he's been otherwise occupied. So in we go to the military base, lining up this gun emplacement. It does take two bombs, so take two there. Try and take out these tents. There's the thunder go notification going through. And I'm quite lucky I only need two bombs here because most of the special objects is already destroyed and that will leave me two bombs for an extra gun emplacement. There the bombs go. And that's the military base seized again. Now I'm going to go and see what I can do at the, uh, the uh, mining plant, even though I've got no bombs and I won't have any by the time I get there. Certainly one of the most frustrating aspects of this aircraft is the very slow reload of the bombs. And just a reminder, I've got it down to 84 seconds. And it is at base 120 seconds, and that's almost unusable. Vampire spots me, comes straight towards me, and realises it's too late, that's a bad idea. And that completes the battle, and we've got a 5 chevron battle, and that's not um, common in this aircraft, I can tell you. 14,625 personal points and a whole host of medals. So, let's review the outcome of this battle, and as we can see from the centre, it's a 5 chevron battle, or a Grade 1 ground attack aircraft. That grossed 414,162 credits, or silver if you prefer, of which about 83,000 came from the premium account bonus. If we look in the chat box, we can see that there were no expenses, whilst the aircraft wasn't destroyed, and I was using prepaid consumables, as usual. Aircraft experience, 3,878, with the premium account bonus and other bonuses coming from things like deliveries and the like. 193 free experience with the premium account bonus there. Five tokens, and these were all for first medals of the day. The Efimov, the Lang, the Winged Legend, the Hero of the Sky, and Thunder. Not a bad haul. On the personal score tab, we can see that two of the three class-specific missions were complete, and 76 sections of ground targets were destroyed. That's a pretty good effort, actually, um, because I think this aircraft is a little bit weak, as I've said, uh, on the actual ground attacking capability. That was more than enough for the five chevrons. 14,625 personal points, six se sectors captured, four aerial targets destroyed, good rig gunner, of course. 1,794 damage to aerial targets, not too shabby at all. Uh, aircraft wasn't lost, uh, 750 capture points received, all of that attacking, unsurprisingly, not really a defensive aircraft. 16 ground targets destroyed, 60,909 damage to ground targets. And if we look on the team score tab, we can see that's enough both by personal points and by chevrons to be first. That would be on either team. Good contributions here from the VB-10, Tier 7 in a Tier 8 battle, and the bomber as well. Uh, stole his thunder a little bit, really. Uh, the vampire struggled a little bit there. B-32, well, I'm glad that it didn't do better, but of course it is a Tier 7 bomber. It still came out on top of his team. Decent contribution from the vampire there. And uh, eff good efforts from the other uh, players as well. And this was a nice battle. And that's the end of my look at the uh, NC-1070, the French Tier 8 Premium Grand Attack aircraft. There was a bundle in the shop for this very, very recently, but that appears to have gone now. But nonetheless, because it's on the tech tree, you can actually buy this in-game for gold, and it will set you back 12,500 gold. As a Grand Attacker, it's got a lot of drawbacks. It's fairly weak uh, armament and fairly weak ordnance as well. It has to be played carefully, and in addition to that, um, it's competing against overpowered bombers, particularly the B-29C Super Fortress. However, with a very potent rear gun, it can still be a lot of fun to play. And, of course, it does have the advantage of being a good crew trainer for all of the major nations if you've got 100,000 credits to spare and swap the aircraft about between them. Well, I hope you found that useful. And if you did, you'll come and see my future content. But until then, this is the Noble Q signing out.